Good afternoon. The Lord be with you. I want to uh, thank the Monday Study Group for the beautiful quilt that you made. I think Annie made it, but it's from all of you, and all of your names are on it. I'm going to show it to you right now. Um, I did send a couple of pictures of it to everybody just a few minutes ago, but um, I think I'll sh try to show it to you on this video. I need to turn the computer to do that, so be patient with the video. All right, here we go. And it doesn't, my Hawaiian shirt does not match the, the quilt. So, okay. All right, there's, there's one, that, that's half of it. And if I turn it full, uh, you'll be able to see it even better. So let's do that. Uh, let's see, I think one of these sides is the top. There we go. All right, this is the top. And it's a bookshelf, as you can see. A bookshelf quilt. I'm going to hold it up as high as I can and maybe you can see more of it that way. I'll step back a little bit too. All right and on the back of course is a, a consistent pattern of scissors and quilt backing but on the front is the bookshelf and everybody's names are on the quilt, on the white part of the quilt. I hope you can see that. Uh, anyway uh, it's beautiful and it goes here in my study, uh, which is the best place for it, uh, because uh, early in the mornings when I get up and come and have a time of meditation and devotion, um, in the winter time, in the fall, in the winter and spring, it's often cool in here. The windows are tend to be open, so uh, it'll be great to have on uh, just to throw over myself while I uh, read scripture and pray and just meditate. So. Again, thanks everybody. All right, uh, we are studying Matthew, uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, and verses 1 through 16. And I've got uh, my version of the study questions, should be the same as yours. And uh, I'd like to go through the chapter with you and just highlight a few things and make a few comments and maybe add to what your study in the commentary has already uh, produced for you. So. There are three sections to this uh, 16 verses, aren't there? The first section is on uh, the plot to kill Jesus, uh, which he announces first, and then there's um, comments in verses 3, 4, and 5 by uh, comments about those who think they will be carrying out this uh, plot against Jesus. We know that another character gets added here at the end. So that's the first section. The second section is um, the anointing at Bethany by here an unnamed woman. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And that's verses 6 through 13. And then verses 14 through 16 are G Judas's um, offer to the leaders, to the chief priests, uh, to betray Jesus to them. So that's the three sections here. Um, Jesus starts in the first section, verses 1 through 5, um, when he finished all these things. And Matthew uses that phrase uh, several times in the gospel, always at the end of a major section of teaching. So this is used here at the end of the section on the uh, apocalyptic discourse and the parables that we've been reading that ended with the parable of the sheep and the goats last time. Um, and so Matthew uses his phrase again. But this time he adds all these things. Um, and that perhaps indicates that this is the end of the formal teaching of Jesus in, in large sections like the Sermon on the Mount and the section on parables and the section in, in uh, Matthew 18 about the church and then this apocalyptic discourse and so forth. So uh, he perhaps is referring to the end of all the teaching. And Jesus says in verse 2, you know that after two days the Passover is coming. So this is probably said on a Wednesday, according to Matthew's chronology, and he's following Mark here. John has a different chronology. Uh, John, if you remember from our study on John, 
John has Jesus die the day the Passover lambs are being slain uh, and for the Passover meal. And so because he has a, a theology, a Christology of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that was announced in the chapter one, as early as chapter one of the Gospel of John. Uh, John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so in John's passion narrative, he has Jesus die not on Friday, but on Thursday, on the day the Passover lambs are being killed. So Mark, Matthew here is following Mark's chronology, not John's. He doesn't know John's. John was probably written uh, after uh, the gospel. All the gospels are written. It's probably the last of the four, uh, four gospels. So Jesus announces that you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. What an announcement uh, to start the chapter with. We've just read about the Son of Man who is coming at the end of all things to be the king and the judge and to separate the sheep and the goats, the glorious returning on the clouds of heaven Son of Man. And now the ignominious son of man who is going to be handed over to be crucified. And he says that to his disciples. And, and they're, I mean, they don't respond here. And who, how could you? Um, they, you know, it's an argument from silence, of course, that there's no response. But still, uh, it is an announcement by Jesus that, that the disciples... I mean, what would you say? Um, they've already heard three passion predictions before this time when Jesus announces what's going to happen to him. Uh, and now uh, he says it again. And he connects the Son of Man's crucifixion with the Passover. Now, that's an indirect way, at least, of indicating that Jesus dies as the Passover sacrifice as the Passover lamb. He doesn't make that Christology explicit the way John does uh, and the way Peter and uh, in First Peter does and I think Paul does in First Corinthians um, does not make that explicit. They do, but Matthew doesn't. But it's implied here in the connection between the Son of Man's crucifixion and Jesus' announcement that He's, this is going to happen during Passover. So uh, Jesus knows that this is going to happen, that the Son of Man will be handed over. Who's going to do the handing over? It's a passive verb here. Uh, he isn't going to hand himself over. And Judas doesn't really hand him over. He betrays him. Um, and perhaps we could see Judas as the agent of the handing over. But the handing over here implies uh, the divine purpose, uh, that God is the one who is planning and carrying out through human agents the handing over of the Son of Man to be crucified. And he's doing that. Of course, Jesus is voluntarily doing that. He does say later in the Garden of Gethsemane, take this cup away from me, um, but nevertheless, thy will be done. And so this handing over is a part of the sovereign action of God uh, to provide uh, in Matthew's Christology, his theology here, um, Jesus as the sacrifice for the sins, not only our sins, as First John says, but the sins of the whole world. He is the Passover lamb. So, uh, the chief priests then uh, appear in verses 3 through 5, and of course, they think they are the ones who are in charge, that they think they're the ones who are going to carry out this um, act of uh, killing of the Son of Man, the crucifixion of the Messiah. Um, but in fact, we see them as sub-actors, merely sub-actors in a divine plot to provide Jesus, to provide the Son, as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And of course, uh, this is one of the ways in which the New Testament prevent, presents the meaning of the death of Jesus. It's not the only way. And it's certainly not a popular way today. 
of the whole idea of human sacrifice and blood sacrifice, which was common in the ancient world and very meaningful to these re first readers in, in Matthew's community and to everyone in the Greco-Roman world, not only Jews, but Gentiles, Romans and Greeks as well, all had a concept of the necessity of sacrifice uh, to, to either placate the gods or to make life go well for them uh, or to cover uh, sins and actions that were deemed unworthy. So in a context like this, a cultural context, it's very significant that Jesus would be presented by Matthew and, and the other gospel writers and Paul, especially Paul, um, as the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. So they are, they are concerned to do this, but not during the festival, they say, uh, lest there be a riot among the people. Well, as it turns out, it's going to be during the festival. In fact, it's going to be a centerpiece of the festival as we read in the Passion narrative uh, in, in all the Gospels. But uh, they were hoping not to have it happen, uh, perhaps to have it ap happen after the festival. And Judas hasn't yet offered to betray Jesus yet, so this will change their plans. But um, they've been planning this uh, for a long time. Uh, I think if you look in chapter 12, of op the opening of chapter 12 in Matthew, you're going to see that the Pharisees there were involved in a plot to kill Jesus. Eventually, somehow, some way, somewhere, uh, they want to bring an end to this one who is a threat to their authority, uh, who they believe is uh, misleading the people, and even bringing Judaism into a dangerous time uh, in which the threat of Roman, uh, Roman oppression will, will get even worse if there is a popular messianic movement surrounding this figure, Jesus, as there had been with other messianic figures before. Um, so they think Jesus is just another one of these pretend messiahs that people are going to get excited about and, and follow and eventually bring the Roman wrath down on them uh, as, as, they, uh, as they follow this Jesus. So they, they are motivated perhaps by a desire to not only protect their own authority, but protect Judaism as it is practiced in Judea and Galilee. Matthew moves immediately then in contrast to the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. And to me, this is a very interesting uh, stylistic uh, move that Matthew makes. Uh, he, he chose when to put the different stories into this narrative. He's following Mark, but he also, uh, the gospel writers also make theologically based choices. And, and here we have a wonderful contrast between the plot to kill Jesus and the anointing of Jesus by um, this unnamed woman. Now, in John's gospel, the woman is named Mary. Uh, and we don't really know which Mary this was. It's often thought that she was Mary Magdalene. Uh, and that's possible. Uh, it's not obviously the mother of Jesus. It, it's, it's likely not the mother of Jesus. That would be very improbable for the story to be told without that detail in it. Uh, this is an unnamed woman, and it, the story ends with that wonderful verse, and I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed, wherever the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom is probably what's in mind here, not the gospel um, that Paul, for example, preaches about Jesus dying and rising, although... Uh, by the time Matthew writes this, that is the gospel, right? The gospel of the kingdom has become the gospel about the king, uh, about the Messiah and his death and resurrection. Um, we, um, Jesus preaches a gospel of the, of the present and coming kingdom of God. But after his death and resurrection, the theme of the kingdom of God largely falls away, not completely, but largely falls away. And the good news is about God's plan of salvation uh, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. So uh, the gospel in the, in the Pauline epistles and in Acts is a bit different from the gospel of the kingdom of God, 
uh, or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew prefers to call it, uh, in, the, in the synoptic gospels. And John doesn't really have much to say about the kingdom at all. There's a little bit, if you were to Google all the references or look in a concordance for references to the word kingdom in John's gospel, um, you don't find very many. Uh, I think one occurs in the Nicodemus passage, but mostly it's about eternal life and faith. Uh, and so it's, it's almost as if eternal life the new life that believers receive by trusting Jesus, by trusting the one whom God has sent and believing in him, that has become, as it were, the, the, a substitute symbol for the kingdom of God in John's gospel. An amazing change also, an amazing translation of the message of Jesus into a different medium and a different vocabulary. Well, we did John before, I won't get more into John. But so here this woman, uh, unnamed, comes and brings an alabaster ointment, a very costly ointment, uh, and pours it on Jesus' head as he was reclining at table. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it may be the most valuable thing she owned. Um, it, it is described in, in, I think, Mark's gospel as worth 300 days wages, 300 denarii, a year's income, uh, a precious, precious thing. Uh, and she gives her most precious gift uh, in love to Jesus. Um, and, and the disciples are immediately angry about it. They don't get it. Um, when we studied the Gospel of Mark, it was very clear that the disciples almost never get it. And here we see that their immediate reaction to, I think it's an almost an anti-feminist reaction in a way. Um, they don't like this woman intruding on their, uh, on their time with Jesus, especially if it's only two days before he says he's going to be crucified. And she comes in and does this scene-stealing act. Um, she steals the scene with this lovely action of anointing Jesus with this costly ointment. Um, and their immediate reaction is not one of, and I wish I wouldn't have had this reaction had I been them. You can put yourself in their place and try to think what your reaction would be. I don't think my first reaction would be, why wasn't this sold and the money given to the poor? Uh, maybe my first reaction should have been that, and it's a commendable reaction. But I think my first reaction would have been, wow, what is this about? This is weird. Uh, I, I wonder what the meaning of it is. Uh, why would she do that? Why are we, why is this happening? Um, I, I hope I would have been curious. And I'm disappointed in them, of course, that they're not curious, as I think I would have been. But who knows, right, if you put yourself in their place. They've already heard this stunning news that the Son of Man is going to be crucified. And the next thing that happens is this woman shows up and pours this ointment on Jesus. And of course, uh, he rejects their anger as legitimate. He says it's not bad to serve the poor. In fact, Mark has a little line that Matthew didn't include if you saw that comparison. Uh, you have the, you always have the poor with you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you don't always have me. That you can help them whenever you want, Matthew didn't include. That was in Mark. Uh, but so Jesus wants his community to be in service to the poor, just as he has been. I mean, his whole ministry, he's always ministering to the marginalized, and the outcasts, and the downcast, and the, the suffering, and the the, the people in physical need and emotional need and demon-possessed. and I mean, all of these people who are poor in the larger sense of that word have been the object of Jesus' ministry. And so here he says, no, you're misinterpreting what's going on here, disciples. She is pouring this ointment on my body as a preparation for my burial. So Jesus is still into what he said uh, opening in verse 2, that the Son of Man is going to be crucified um, in connection with the Passover. And so that's where his mind is. That's where his heart is on what's going to happen next. And 
here uh, he sees what she has done in that light as a preparation for his burial. Bodies were anointed after they died. And in the other Gospels, the women come to the tomb because the anointing hasn't been done. And Joseph of Arimathea comes to anoint the body of Jesus because it hasn't been done. But here in Matthew, the anointing happens before the death of Jesus. He sees this action as a symbolic anointing of his body for burial. And so Matthew doesn't ever uh, present the intention of the women after Jesus has died and been buried to come to the tomb with the spices to anoint his body for burial, um, as, both, uh, as all the other Gospels do. So Matthew leaves that out because he's already had a burial anointing, uh, this scene. Even though he knows it's in Mark, he leaves it out because here he has had uh, an anointing of Jesus for burial. So what this good work that she has done for him will be told uh, in remembrance of her uh, as long as the gospel is preached and wherever the gospel is proclaimed, the good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for us all on our behalf. And here she is seen as someone who um, perhaps doesn't know that that's the motive that Jesus will attribute to her action. Um, she doesn't say that, he does. But it seems on her part, as a loving and sacrificial thing, she gives Jesus perhaps the best thing she has out of love. And so what a contrast to Judas, right? Um, she gives the most costly thing she has. And, and you have to read this, I think, as Judas being so angry that um, Jesus has contradicted the disciples' claim that the perfume should have been sold and given to the poor. Uh, so angry that Jesus rejected their, their anger about what the woman did, that he goes to one of the 12, you know, Matthew says, uh, highlighting that this is one of Jesus' inner circle, people who traveled with him and been with him for probably two and a half years, went to the chief priests, who are the plotters up in the first five verses, right? They're the plotters. They're he goes to the bad guys, to the enemy uh, of, the, of what's going to happen to Jesus. Um, and, and he says, what will you give me? Now, the woman has just given everything that she, well, her most valued possession for sure. Uh, John's gospel makes Judas the angry one in his gospel. He is the one who is, gets contradicted by Jesus. And Maybe it's out of anger. We always try to find a motive for Judas's betrayal of Jesus. And the one that Matthew implies because of the way he structures this section is greed. Um, he implies that Judas went out of greed uh, because he, he was the one who kept the purse, John's Gospel tells us, and perhaps he wasn't intending to give it all to the poor. Uh, this is very, very valuable stuff. And Maybe as treasurer of the group, he thought he had a right to his cut. Uh, that's reading in what's not here. But Judas uh, says, what will you give me if I betray him to you? He doesn't just go saying, I am so angry at this false Messiah, I'm going to betray him to you. He wants something out of it. And what he wants is apparently money. And so greed, apparently, both, you might say, both Matthew and John agree that Judas was motivated by greed. And they agree to pay him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. So the insider becomes an outsider. Um, it would be very appropriate here to go to John's gospel um, and to the account of the Last Supper and to uh, see what Jesus says to Judas in John's Gospel. But we'll talk about that next week. Uh, the passage immediately next that we're going to take up is the Passover that Jesus eats with his disciples and the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so we'll talk about who was there, 
and what happened and the meaning of that event. But I hope this 25 minute plus uh, video uh, has given you some further uh, reasons to uh, see yourself at some place in the story, uh, at, either as one of the amazed disciples who are stunned in silence, uh, to see yourself in the woman, perhaps even to see ourselves as Judas in some way, um, that we uh, are often motivated um, by less than honorable motives in our lives. And um, that, speaking for myself, I haven't always lived in a way uh, that honored Jesus and, uh, and that in some ways betrayed who he really was and is for me. So that you can uh, mull over and meditate on for yourself. Uh, this is our, be, the beginning of the Passion Narrative. Um, and we'll be uh, studying the rest of Matthew's Gospel, the Passion Narrative, in the weeks to follow. Thank you uh, for participating in the study for the wonderful quilt. Um, God bless you this week. And I'll send you study questions on the next section uh, later on this week. Take care. Be well.